Joining the show today is national reporter for The Athletic, covering NHL draft prospects, Scott Wheeler. Scott, appreciate you jumping on with us. Thanks for having me, fellas. It's uh, We're getting back into the swing of things. The hockey season is back upon us here in August, so I'm... Uh... I'm just just sort of ramping up now, and and we're we're ready to go. The Hlinka World Junior Summer Showcase rookie tournaments are around the corner. Looking forward to it. Yeah, the the classic what three week break that uh, most people in hockey get. Yeah, I took two and a half off, and that's actually other than for my uh, paternity leave, my parental leave. That two and a half week stretch was the longest I've taken off in eight years at the Athletic. So it was nice to unplug for a little bit before heading down to Plymouth for the summer showcase. Having just gone through some of my parental leaves, Scott, I can vouch for how odd it is to not work or write for a number of weeks in a row. It was kind of big like time. Crap. Um, big time. Six, six weeks in a row, you're like, okay, this is, I know it's the summer, but still, you kind of get yeah. the itch a little bit. Yeah. And the first, the first, I've had two kids at the athletic, and the first, our, our first son, I was writing a book during it. So it didn't really feel like parental leave, if you will. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's, it's hard in our business to unplug. And my schedule is such that, in the summer, you've got all of these other events. And then at Christmas time, when people typically take some time off, I'm off to the world juniors. So I just don't get that typical flow of, of the hockey season really. Yeah. And uh, we typically open up with a, a wild question, but it just seems so fitting. How can we make this about the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> Talk about your book. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a real joy to put together. Obviously, the NHL draft is my bag. And so when they when they approached me, it wasn't typically you go to a publisher with an idea, right? This was the reverse. This was the publisher coming to me with an idea. And so when they approached me, they kind of wanted initially to do just kind of a history of the Toronto Maple Leafs at the NHL draft. Uh, and I kind of flipped it back to them and said, okay, what if, what if we jumped? What if we didn't do every draft? What if it was just sort of behind the scenes stories? And let's do 20 chapters and 20 great stories from the draft and I can report it out and speak to people and we can do it that way rather than it being kind of an encyclopedia. So that's, that's what it became. And I spoke to 60 or 70 people for the book, uh, former GMs, former players, former scouts, agents who were involved with players, family members of players, that kind of a thing. And just sort of pieced together over the course of a two year process, these, these sort of 20 stories beginning with, Walt McKechnie, the first player they ever took and sort of sitting down with Walt McKechnie. He's actually got a restaurant in, in cottage country where, where my family now lives. And so I know Walt a little bit. He's actually a town councilor up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so sort of sitting down with Walt McKechnie to go over what the draft was like in its very first uh, sort of experience. And then all the way to the lottery night with Brendan Shanahan and what he was go what was going through his mind when he cracked that big smile on TV when they got when they infamously got uh, got Austin Matthews and all that stuff. So it was and and some weird stories that people had never heard in between. You get stories about them not not even scouting Mike Medano and Timu Solani because they didn't have the budget and uh, sort of great behind the scenes look at how how they missed on some players, how they hit on some others trading to Rask, all of that. So it was, it was a ton of fun. Now, typically some teams are more protective than others, especially with their scouts and making them available. I know with this is a benefit of having some history or nostalgia or guys that are no longer work for the organization. How yeah. are the Leafs in terms of recep being receptive to well, obviously Shanahan talks, so he's part of the organization, but how are they to this book? Yeah, the Leafs gave me Shanny. They gave me Wendell. Uh, they, they they ended up giving me four or five people. I probably made eight or nine requests to the Leafs, and they gave me four or five. Um, they they were fine. Uh, working with them was fine throughout the book. They didn't stand in my way, really, on anything. Uh, but the vast majority of the people I spoke to are people that are out of the organization, um, sort of former scouts that are now with other teams or former scouts that are retired or GMs. I spoke with almost every single GM from the start of the draft through till now. Um, actually didn't, the Leafs didn't make Kyle Dubas. He was, he was one of the people that they didn't make available to me. I think they didn't want sort of inside baseball on how they make their picks with their current GM at the time, uh, to, to sort of speak with me for the book. But I, I was really happy when they made Shani available and Shani was great. The chapter that Shani did with me, uh, was awesome. Sort of going through the, the process with Austin Matthews and specifically that lottery night and what it was like back then. It's no longer like that. Now they have everybody on zooms, but Shani's lottery was really the last one where 
16 NHL general managers were all in the room and they were stepping off camera one at a time. And it was a very, very unique mm -hmm. night for Austin Matthews' lottery. And uh, he sort of shakes Kevin Cheveldayoff's hand and Kevin Cheveldayoff walks off screen. And then Shani said he basically couldn't help himself, but he cracks this huge infamous <laughs> smirk. Um, so the, that, that, that was some great theater and sort of his, I, I, he walked me through his head during the commercial breaks and what he was thinking as it came down. Like it was, it was sort of really great the way he walked me through it. So, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the Leafs were fine. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't give me everybody I was looking for, but they gave me, uh, some of the big ones. So what's better though, the, the shanty smirk or the sack scowl? Yeah, <laughs> both pretty good. And, uh, I, I was on a pod pod with, uh, with some Detroit Red Wings fans, uh, a week ago and they've obviously infamously had the worst luck they've almost moved back every single time and they still got more at cider and lucas raymond and some guys but uh they, they they didn't get the luck at the end of their dynasty they had a they were in the lottery a lot and are now obviously trying to work their way out so it can go both ways it's yeah. worked out well for the new jersey devils and the edmonton oilers and, and the leafs obviously um but there are teams like detroit that have never won it that uh that are that are itching and as a result struggling to to find star players to play in their core right like dylan is dylan larkin good enough the answer is probably not right they need they need more in detroit and the lottery can play a, a huge role in that and sometimes it just comes down to the lottery balls if you will right that is a fact well uh as you know our uh podcast is called fellowship of the rink a nod to some lord of the rings fandom for us yep. uh Curious if you're an LOR fan or what's your nerd itch, I guess, if you are, if you were to say like you collect stuff, do you, is there some like a movie or book series you're, you're all over or what's your nerd itch? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings, grew up on the movies. They were kind of my era, if you will. Um, my big nerd thing growing up, less so now, but growing up, uh, me and my brothers used to play Magic the Gathering. That was our sort of collector's thing. We would my brother worked at a game. My oldest brother worked at a game store and we would go and do drafts at, at the local game store. And uh, we played a lot of MTG in, in my teenage years. So that that was probably the the big thing growing up that all three of us bonded over. We'd go up to the cottage at Christmas and crack open packs and draft and build decks and and play each other. And uh, so MTG was that was probably it for me growing up. Nice. The. The draft going to centralize, um, decentralize it kind of surprise a lot of people or affect a lot of people's jobs and everything like that. How will it affect you, you think? And what do you think about the idea of it not going from out, out with a bang, of course, in Vegas, but how that might change things for teams and for reporters like you who cover the draft? Yeah, I, I don't love it. Certainly, there will just be less people there. I mean, you know as well as anyone that the, the real benefit of the draft isn't the, that we're there to talk to the players and, and sort of tell their stories. Obviously, that's great, and it's a huge night for them, and we like to capture it. But the real benefit of that week has traditionally been the time that you get to spend with people without their PR people standing in front of them with general managers and directors of scouting, and everybody is there, and that is no longer going to be the case uh, by all accounts, the top prospects will still be there. Their agents will still be there. You'll have a representative from each team that I wouldn't expect to be the director or or uh, or the general manager. I expect that all of those people will stay home. Uh, they might have celebrity representatives uh, representing the teams instead. And the night is just going to look a lot different than it has. I also think from a fan perspective, it's going to be watered down. I, I think one of the things to the NHL's credit that they've done better than other leagues over the years, I think is the draft. I think it's one of the products that the NHL has had kind of perfected. Uh, it's the only place, the only time of the year that you get to see extremely private people. We know how private hockey managers are people like Lou Amarello, Steve Eiserman. You get to see people who don't like to be in front of the camera in front of the camera. You get to see how the sausage is made. I thought it was a great spectacle the way that it was built in the past. I thought they knocked Vegas out of the park uh, so it's disappointing. I, it, it's not going to look or feel the same. It's not going to have the same ambiance. The product on TV, I think, for fans who are watching at home is going to be worse. Uh, it's, it's. I, I think they may move back. Uh, there is a lot of chatter. I've spoken with multiple directors and multiple general managers who said if they voted today that they would switch their vote from a no uh, or from a yes on decentralization to a no on decentralization. So I don't think this is the last of it. I think they're going to test it out next year. 
see what it looks like, see how people feel about it. I think when the next CBA reopens in two years, they're going to completely rejig the schedule, which is really the gripe that most general managers and directors had was the time between the draft and free agency was too short. Travel in and out of cities was often a problem. People had big, big issues a year ago, right before they voted in Nashville, which I think made people that that was in the back of their mind. The travel nightmares coming in and out of Nashville was in the back of people's minds. I do think we're going to have another centralized draft at some point. I do think they're going to revote at some point uh, and open up potentially going back to the old format. There's even been some talk about doing it uh, in Vegas every year kind of thing. Uh, so the, the, the door isn't completely closed, but I do think next year, because they this vote has been so recently and they're not going to re-vote overnight, I do think next year we're going to see a different format and, and they'll see how they feel about it. And then they'll likely in the next CBA go back to teams and say, okay, if we can get you more of a cushion between the draft and free agency, how do you feel about going back to the the classic format? Sure. And obviously the draft, and I'd, I'd say the last month or so leading up is essentially your Super Bowl. What's the day-to-day -day throughout the season though? Like obviously there's different milestones, big tournaments, but like what is a day in the life of Scott Wheeler? Yeah. So obviously I, I hit all the major events. So Memorial Cup, U18 Worlds, World Juniors, Selection Camps, Rookie Tournaments, all that stuff, the Top Prospects games. Now, the CHL Top Prospects game is officially no more, but typically the CHL Top Prospects game and the USHL All-American game are both happen in January. The All-American game is on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. That is going to continue, but they've started a new format heading into this season where they're actually planning to play a U18 top prospects sort of head-to-head, -head, Canada, Canada versus U.S., CHL versus the NTDP. Uh, and as a result, the CHL top prospects game will be no more. But I, I hit all of those checkpoints. Then if I have a story that I really want to do this year, for example, I went to East Lansing to do a story on Artyom Levshunov in the fall and sort of embedded with the Michigan State Spartans as part of the rejuvenation of that program. So stories like that, I typically throw in two or three other trips a year on top of the major events that I have to be at. Uh, and then when I'm at home, I'm in OHL rinks normally about once a week uh, on a Friday, Saturday or Sunday, occasionally a Wednesday, I'll get out to an OHL game, uh, try to show face and, and see those kids as much as possible. Uh, and then my week is typically two days of video and three days of, of interviews and writing and <clears throat> sort of publishing stuff. So I, I typically like Thursday or Thursday and Friday, sometimes it's just Friday, but Thursday and Friday, if I'm done my my filed my stories from the week, I'll sit down and, and pull up Instat and watch kids over in Europe and that kind of a thing. And I try to dedicate two out of five days a week just to, to watching video and taking notes on these kids to make sure that I'm on top of, of who's who and, and who's on the rise and that kind of a thing. So uh, I'm lucky that way, where when I'm not on the road, we, we all get to work from home. We don't have a dedicated office space or anything that we have to go to. So uh, just try to get into OHL ranks. Last year, there was a kid locally at SAC, Dean Latourneau, who was playing at St. Andrews College, who was a potential first round pick. So SAC's, I mean, I, I grew up across the street from SAC. So uh, went and saw Dean play a, a few times at SAC and that kind of a thing. And uh, that's, that's pretty much the schedule every week is try to get into the rink once or twice and then when I'm not in the rink, it's phone calls and, and video and, and writing. How do you evaluate a kid playing in such a non-traditional like league to be a, a you know a first round talent? But yeah, not see them against that kind of competition. Yeah, typically those kids get to go down on their Christmas break and then at the end of the season to play in the USHL. So you at least get a little bit of them against a better competition. Dean did do that. He went down on his Christmas break and played two games in the USHL. But when he was supposed to go down at the end of the season, he'd actually hurt his shoulder. He'd blown out his shoulder. And so he didn't get to go down and play those like seven, eight more games in the USHL that some guys typically do. Uh, and as a result, the book on Dean in particular was really small. Now, the benefit is there's been a kid who's come through SAC basically once a year, once every other year for the last seven or eight years. So they've had, you've got three or four other players from SAC that you can measure him against. And then on the flip side, the, SAC plays a much better schedule now than they used to. Uh, they SAC actually was part of creating the prep hockey conference, which has some very good schools, including uh, Shattuck St. Mary's, who obviously produce players every year for the draft and had three more this year who were in consideration for the draft. 
um, so that you get to you get some measuring stick games that way. But it's hard. Like it's it's an imperfect science with a player like Dean Latourno, and is even more complicated by the fact that he's six foot seven mm-hmm. and was one of the most unique prospects in this draft, forgetting the league that he played in. So. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see him at Boston College next year because it's a big jump to go from SAC directly into BC. He actually wasn't initially going to go to BC until Will Smith uh, turned pro and, and was going to San Jose. They didn't have a roster spot for him. So he was, when I did my feature on Dean, he told me he was going next season to play uh, play for uh, in the USHL. So uh, him going directly into BC now that Will Smith is turning pro with San Jose is going to be really interesting. A guy you saw at the showcase was Eve Byam, a guy I know yep. Minnesota Wild fans are hyped about. Um, and you did the winners and losers of the draft uh, for one of your stories. The Wild were one of the the winners, especially from day one. Just what struck you the most about that pick, and and what do you like um, about Zeev in terms of how he could fit? I mean, I think Zeev's a star. Uh, Zeev was fourth on my list, obviously. So I I believe that wherever they got him, thirteen, twelve. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, that that he was one of the picks of the draft. Frankly, uh, Zeev is arguably the best player. Last year was arguably the best player, uh, best defenseman I've ever watched at that age at college at the college hockey level. He was better than the Hughes brothers. He was better than Owen Power. Uh, he was better than Zach Wierenski, Charlie McAvoy, Seth Jones. You name it. Like he had an all-time teenaged freshman year in college. Uh, He's extremely mobile. He's got sort of the defining quality of his game offensively is his sort of shoulder fakes and head fakes. He makes a lot of guys miss. Uh, he he sort of walks the line and beats guys off the line extremely, extremely well. Uh, and that was always a big part of his game at the program, but really found another level last year. And then beyond that, what really elevated him last year was his defensive play and his ability to lock guys up. He was unbelievable against BC and BU in the Frozen Four. I mean, you were there. He he was he was outstanding. Uh, and locked up Macklin Celebrini, locked up that top line for BC with Will Smith, Gabe Perot, and Ryan Leonard. Uh, like he just glued himself to those guys defensively with his footwork and made it so hard on them. And there's there's actually a little bit of Brock Faber that way, where Brock has always relied on his footwork. Now, Zeev at this age is way ahead of where Brock was in terms of offensive talent. Um, they both have the skating. They're both about the same size. Um, they both defend at a very high level. Brock was probably a little bit more polished defensively, but offensively, Zeev has another level. And I think we'll eventually bump Brock off of PP1 and become the PP1 guy for the wild. So like, I, th- I think he's got like 60, like I think we're talking like 60 point upside. Like I think we're looking at a star player here if, if he continues on the path that he's been on over the last year. Dang. And I mean, the wild have been spoiled with Brock Faber, uh, called a runner up. Don't tell them that, but he came in and set pretty wild expectations for a first year defenseman. And granted he did that off his junior year. What do you expect for Zeev Williams timeline? Like, is he going to play one more year, come out this spring and off to the races? Or when do you expect him to actually grab an NHL spot? No, I think that's the timeline you're looking at. I think he goes back for his sophomore year. He turns, he signs and turns pro in the spring. He's immediately in the Minnesota wild lineup. Uh, I don't know whether he'll he'll play big minutes right away. Oftentimes when those guys get in for the last five or 10 games of the year, they, they get eased in a little bit. And I think that's probably the right play for him. Uh, but he's going to be the number one D for USA at the World Juniors. They've got the rare opportunity to go back-to-back. USA has never won back-to-back golds at the World Juniors. I think they and Canada are the favorites again this year. Um, and so he's, he's going to be the guy there. He, he could be the tournament MVP at the World Juniors if things break right for him. Uh, he's going to play 30 minutes there. He's going to play 30 minutes at Denver under an excellent coach who is coincidentally his coach for the world junior team and David Carl. Uh, and then I expect him to come out and, and play. And if not be an impact guy right away, then I expect, I wouldn't be surprised if he's an impact guy in 2025, 2026 as sort of his first full season. And, uh, in, in the rookie of the year conversation and that, like, I think that's the, the caliber of player that we're talking about. What can we expect from like a healthy rider, Richie? Yeah, Ryder. Ryder's an interesting one. Obviously, has played some really good hockey in spurts over the course of the last two years. Uh, creative, crafty player, good skater, good skill, uh, but just hasn't maybe met expectations relative to what he looks like when you watch him. Like you watch him play, and you think that's an excellent skater. That's a really skilled player. 
he should be more productive than he is. And part of that is the injury troubles and some bad breaks. Obviously wasn't a part of the World Junior uh, conversation this time around. I don't expect that he will be even in December. Even if he gets off to a great start, he's probably not going to be in the conversation given how deep this Canadian team is. But two years from now, uh, that's when you're looking at Ryder Ritchie and saying, okay, as a 19-year-old, can he be a 100-point guy in the WHL and the kind of player who's on the Canadian World Junior team in his final year of junior? So still a two-year process. He's going to play junior the next two seasons. Uh, and then you sort of go from there with him. But I, I think if, if, if he's developed properly, you're looking at a middle six winger who adds some secondary offense. I think that's the hope. We'll do Thank some <laughs> factor fiction with this claim from the wild fourth round pick, the Finnish young defenseman, uh, Aaron Kubari. I think it's Kubari who told, uh, maybe, maybe. Give me, yeah, I'm a Finn too. So I should be able to get that pronunciation right. Um, who told Bill Guerin, you got the steal of the draft. Yeah. Now, you and I call him the steal of the draft since there's a lot of players in the draft, but like how off or odd is his assessment from where he landed and what he can be? Well, I, I mean, I think TV Haru you should have been a, a second round pick in this draft. Uh, and so obviously getting him in the fourth is great value for me. Um, obviously a very, very complicated development path over the last year. Uh, the knee injury really sort of set him back. He skating has also been the concern about about uh, Aaron traditionally. So the fact that he hurt his knee and then when he came back at U18 Worlds, he looked a little slow. Uh, that that just raised some red flags for teams. You've got a 5'9 defenseman who isn't a high-end skater uh, and has missed significant time due to injury. But in saying that, I mean, there were players picked ahead of him in the fourth round there that I don't think have any chance of getting signed, let alone playing in the NHL. And Aaron Kibihari is going to be a first-pairing defenseman for the Finnish World Junior Team this year. He's going to get signed by the Minnesota Wild. He's going to at least be an AHL, def AHL power play defenseman. Uh, he would have been a full-time defenseman in Liga last year. I spoke with the coaching staff there. They said he easily, quote, easily was a top six defenseman for that team in the fall before he got injured. Um, so I, I like, I love that. It's exactly the kind of value play I think teams should be making at that range in the draft. And coincidentally, I mean, I know you're a Finn as well. They're going to, they're, just speaking of the World Junior Summer Showcase, they could have there could be three wild prospects on that team. Kivi Haru is a lock. He could be the captain of that team. Rasmus Kumpalainen is going to be a middle six center, I would think, for that team and is also absolutely a lock. Uh, and then Sebastian Soini was at the World Junior Summer Showcase this week and was shockingly not on the U18 team. I heard there was just a bit of a rift between him and the coach. The coach didn't like him, hadn't liked what he'd seen of him previously. There were actually members of the Finnish Hockey Federation who were saying that he should have been on that team privately and that they made a mistake. There were teammates of his on that Finnish U18 team who said that he should have been on that team. And now, lo and behold, two months later, three months later, he has been invited to play at the World Junior Summer Showcase, even though he wasn't on the U18 team prior. So uh, Soini is a player who I think, because he's a righty and they're, they're a little light on righties for this age group for the Finns. He could be on that team as well. So you're going to have all sorts of, plus we haven't even talked about Riley Height and others. You're going to have all sorts of wild flair, I think, at this year's, uh, at this year's tournament. Yeah. And for, forgive the pun, but speaking of height, gotta ask, is really the, the only difference between you and your colleague, Corey Pronman that you don't embrace height uh, discrimination? <laughs> Well, me and Corey do view it a little bit differently that way. Um, he tends to value, you're right, the, the size component more than I do. Um, and we've 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 had some really good debates over play, some players in recent draft classes that we've disagreed on. Uh, a player like Zach Benson, for example, that I was really high on, that Corey was lower on, and then on the flip side, some of the bigger guys that I was lower on. So I, it does create for some good debates. Uh, certainly, I think size is a premium specifically for defensemen. I think it matters less and less up front, frankly, uh, but still is, uh, I mean, there's a reason that the St. Louis Blues and the Tampa Bay Lightning and uh, the Vegas Golden Knights teams that won the Stanley Cup looked the way that they did on the blue line and were so successful with the length that they had, all three of those teams in particular. Uh, but then you've got the Colorado Avalanche who have four of their top six defensemen are 5'10", 5'11", right? So uh, there's there's different ways to build a team. And I think you get into trouble when you get carried away with size. Uh, I mean, we've seen Olin Zellweger, Lane Hudson, Logan Stankoven, the, the guys who tend to be the steals, the real risers from each draft class, 
tend to be those smaller skilled guys. And, and those guys, I still think have a role to play, especially if they're, if their skill level is sort of of the elite, elite level. So I've always been high on the Lane Hudson's and the Zellweger's and the Stan Coven's. They were really, really high on my lists. Uh, and on, uh, I've also been too high on some smaller guys over the years too. So th there's, there's a balancing act that way. Speaking of height, I mean, do you think he's a guy who can play in the NHL this year? I know how that decision will have to make in the first nine games and, I'm surprised he felt 64 as it was, and he can definitely be an NHL player. But. Yeah, I, I, I don't think he's quite there, honestly. Uh, I think another season back in, in, in the WHL isn't the worst thing in the world for him. I don't even think he's a lock. And based off of what some of the things that some of the staff with Hockey Canada said in the world at the World Junior Summer Showcase this week, I think there's mixed opinions even within Hockey Canada on Riley Height. He wasn't good for them at U18 Worlds in his draft year. Now, that was a long time ago, but it's the same – by and large, the same management group that's making these decisions, those things do linger. Uh, and I think there, even Dave Cameron talked about his inconsistency this week. I thought Riley was great this week at the World Junior Summer Showcase. Uh, I thought he was one of the most noticeable players for, for Hockey Canada offensively in particular. He was blocking shots. He was physically engaged. Uh, he's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder these days, I think, because folks at Hockey Canada and others don't view him maybe in the regard that that someone like I do. I do. Uh, I had him as a first round player in his draft year. Obviously he wasn't taken in the first round, but that's where I had him rated. Um, and I uh, ultimately, I mean, we've got our world junior summer show or world junior roster projections for the big four countries. Corey, Max and I have put together uh, a sort of a mini panel and decided on Ross projected rosters. And we do have height on our Ross on our projected roster, uh, but he's not a lock there. I, I, the way that we broke it down, there are up front, of the 13 forwards, there are nine locks, which means there's really only because of how many returnees there are, there are nine locks. So uh, including Gavin McKenna, the the star 2026 prospect in that group as well. Uh, so that means there's really only four jobs to be won. And you start to look at the list. I mean, we've got TG Ginla off our roster. We've got Beckett Seneke off our roster. We've got Andrew Crystal, one of the leading scorers in the WHL the last two seasons off our roster. Uh, and, and so could one of those guys make the team over Riley Height? Absolutely. It's There's going to be some big, big names left mm -hmm. off this Canadian World Junior team. But at the end of the day, I still think Height's going to be on, on that team. Um, and and you go from there. I think you spend a year in the WHL. Hopefully he goes to the World Juniors and makes an impact for a deep, deep Canada. And then the following season is when you really sort of challenge. Now, if, if they want to give him nine games, they should give him nine games and see how he does. Uh, I mean, Boston did that with Matt Poitra last year and then Matt Poitra stuck around all year. Right. So those guys do have a way of figuring it out and smart players and Riley Height is an extremely smart mm -hmm. player. Uh, smart players can play with other good players, even if they're maybe not ready in other ways. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he looked fine in nine games and stuck around a little or that kind of thing. And then was lent out to the world juniors and spent the second half in the, in the WHL. That's often a path for some of those kids. So, uh, but I'm, I'm, he'll he'll be one he'll be one to watch in training camp for sure. Yeah, and like you said, you definitely weren't alone in giving him a first round grade. And a lot of Wild fans have talked themselves into him essentially being the first round pick from that draft yep. class. I'm not sure how closely you saw it, but I, I imagine you're at least somewhat aware of the turmoil from the Charlie Strammel selection. Yeah. Can you talk about just what you see in Charlie as a prospect and? what we need to see this year as he transitions over to Michigan state to, you know, really deem it a successful season. Yeah. I mean, it's been tough. Obviously I was, I was lower on Stramel to begin with, but in saying that I, I understood at the time why people were so excited about him. He was injured and missed a good chunk of time uh, throughout his two years at the program. But right before his second of two injuries at the program, he looked like, like maybe even a top 10 pick. They, they called him the big rig. He was this big, strong kid. He could absolutely rip the puck. He moved fine for his size. And he was just a freak athlete who could really impose himself as a centerman on games. Then he gets back. He gets back healthy. He's never really a top player on that team after that point. He became kind of a fourth line center for that team, third, fourth line center for that team. Um, he was also playing up uh, a, a sort of up an age group, if you will, because he was a late birthday. Uh, he wasn't with his draft class worth of players. He was ahead of them. Um, but it, then, then he goes to Wisconsin and Wisconsin, I thought was uh, in a big transition period. That team, that program was a mess, frankly. Um, one of the 
messiest programs in college hockey. They changed the coaching staff. Uh, I've got a ton of respect for the new coaching staff. Um, but it's, it was a work in progress and he kind of got caught on a roster influx at, at, with the Badgers and just didn't really look himself. Then he also got injured again and missed some time. And it's just been a rough couple of years for him. And he hasn't looked especially offensively, like he's got it. Uh, and he just wasn't imposing himself on games in the same way. So now he's gets to hit the restart button and you just hope he can become an NHL player. Like I think that is ultimately, if he plays NHL games, that's what you're measuring success by now. Um, he's got to get signed first though. Like he's got so many steps he's got to take here. He's going to have to play in the AHL and prove himself in the AHL. He's going to have to play well enough in college to get signed. Uh, but if, I, I think as far as this season goes, if he can be a 20 points in 30 game guy, like, I think that's what you're hoping for. He's not all of a sudden going to be a point per game, first line offensive player, but if he can just be a regular contributor offensively and not a bit of a black, the bit of a black hole that he was at Wisconsin offensively, if he can be a second power play guy and, and score eight or nine goals in call, like it's hard to score 10 goals in division one. It really is 10 goals is the barometer for a good season for any player, no matter who, whether you're a first round pick or undrafted guy, 10 goals is kind of what any coach will tell you is a good season. If he can score 10 goals and 20 points, that would be, that would be a great step forward for him and just play with a little more pace. Like he just needs, he needs to show that he can play with more pace. We have some uh, fan questions on Twitter. We'll try to get wrapped through some of these quick ones for you. Um, we know you're off. We'll come back over to the uh, North America next year. Um, we have a fan who asked, could he play in the Wilds' top six this year if he did come over? I think the answer is probably yes. His move from the wing to center and how good he looked at center last year completely changed his trajectory. Uh, Europe was a player who I had in my top 10 in his draft year, so he's a player I've always been really high on. But he just never seemed to get the looks and the power play time and the puck touches that he needed when he was on the wing at the KHL level. Certainly at the junior level, whether he was playing wing or not, he was going to dominate because of his skill level, because he's de got decent size, he, he's an incredibly smart player. Uh, all of those things made him a dominant player against his peers, but there was really three parts of three years there where he just wasn't involved with the KHL team. And then I started to worry about his development last year was kind of like, okay, if he doesn't, if he can't play 15 minutes a night for them, if they're going to play him six minutes a night again, his, his development is going to be in trouble. Like his progress is going to be hindered by the fact that he spent, then it, it would have been four seasons basically of toiling away in the KHL. Um, so the fact that he, they moved him to center and then he just seemed to find a role on that team and he was excellent right away as a center, I think because of the smarts piece, it just he just made it work. Uh, it changed everything. Now, now you've got a potential center. Uh, he's, a, he's obviously a natural winger, but I think he, he's, he's going to be a center now. Like that's a big deal. So, um, and, and then obviously the production and being the team's leading scorer and all of that is huge, huge, huge deal for a player that age in, in the KHL. Now, I don't think the KHL now post-war is what it was. Uh, they, they aren't getting the same level of imports. They aren't getting as many AHL players coming over. So it's predominantly a Russian league now. Uh, and, and I mean, there are still North Americans over there and some good ones, but I do think the the level of the KHL is a little bit lower now than it was. So some of those records that some of these kids are breaking, like Michkov and Yurov, I think you do have to take with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, but, I mean, he still did it. He still went out there and was one of the best players on a night-to-night -night basis as a center in a top professional league at an early age. Like, he's he's a stud. He's I, I think he's got legit top six upside. Like, he's going to be an impact. I'm not sure he's going to be a true star player. Like, I don't think you're getting Kaprizov kind of thing but I think he's going to be an impact guy in the NHL. So would you view him as like tops of the prospect pool for the wild or like who, who would you label loosely as your top three guys in the pool today? Oh, he's the top forward prospect. No question. I mean, it depends how you rate Jesper Wallstead. Um, but I think it's, it's Wallstead and, and you're off right now. Are there, they're sort of two top guys. And then Booyam is obviously uh, on D is in a, in a stratosphere of his own. He was the most underrated player in the Ross Prosser pool? Oh, well, I don't know if height is underrated at this point. I know uh, certainly from the mentions I get about him from wild fans, he's not underrated in the state of Minnesota, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think height maybe feels 
a little bit that way to me. Uh, I think Kivi Haru, based off of where he was drafted, is is a little underrated. Um, that, that obviously we've, I'm sure you guys have talked about it, but the D and Iowa had a tough co last season. So, mm-hmm. um, the, I, I don't know whether any of those players are underrated at the moment because they actually really did struggle by and large. Uh, I, th- I thought Lambos was better later in the year. Um, Hunt is obviously a, a an option, he's, he's made himself at least an NHL option now. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Kiwi Haru for me. On the blue line, just uh, like you said, not a great year. Looking at their development, like that was a year where it was a pretty young team, inexperienced. That, that's not going to bode well when you have a very, very green blue line. Yeah. Do you expect to see them take significant steps this year? Or do you think that last year is indicative of some of these guys maybe not having what it takes? Well, I, I am starting to worry about O'Rourke. Um O'Rourke's a kid that I thought maybe had a, had a real opportunity for a long time to be kind of a, a hard nosed physical number five to seven defenseman in the NHL who had a three, 400 game career and was a, was a decent depth defenseman. I'm not sure now that, that he has that. Uh, I would expect to, I, I do still think there might be something in Lambos. He's obviously had the health complications when he was in the WHL that sort of set him back. He also was a pandemic player who had to go over and play in Finland in his draft year. And uh, I think all of those kids who had to go over to Europe and or or stayed and didn't play at all, like a Wyatt Johnston, uh, those guys, it, it, they just had unique paths. They've had to navigate it a little bit differently than your typical draft class would have to. Um, I think we're seeing it with players like Brennan Offman in New York. Like guys are just taking a little bit longer uh, with Wyatt Johnson, honestly, being the exception to that maybe. Um, so I, I think Lambo still has a chance. I like spot check. Like there are, there are some potential options there, but I think that's what you're hoping for out of those guys, like a spot check or a Lambo. So you're hoping they become options. I don't think you're expecting them to become options. So it's a bit of a recalibration that way, where typically you take a kid like Lambos in the first round and you pencil him in as, okay, this kid's going to be one of our top six D in the future. Now you're hoping he does rather than expecting him to be. Last one from the Twitter fan questions is how many wild prospects do you see as impact NHL players, like a top six forward, top four D I mentioned Moss, that would be number one goalie, but like of the guys you have in the prospect pool right now, how many of them are top six guys, top four D? Well, I, I, I think the big three, like Yurov's going to be a top six guy. Boyum, I think is going to be a first pairing defenseman. I still believe Jesper Wallstedt's going to be a starting goalie in the league. So that those are your three big ones. Uh, I like Ogren to become a, a potential second line guy. He might be sort of a scoring third line guy. Like that might be his future. I'm not sure he maybe has quite enough offense. Uh, certainly he can shoot the puck, but I'm not sure he's that cerebral enough a playmaker to to be a, like a 50 point winger in the NHL, like a second line, like a surefire second line winger. But if Liam Ogren had a career as a 20, 20, 40 guy and made 4 million bucks a year, three and a half, 4 million bucks a year in the NHL, like I think that would be still be a good outcome for Liam Ogren. I think he's got that in him. So Ogren, I expect to get there. Um, after that, yeah, I, I don't think there's, there's a lot that way. Um, that guys like Hunter Haight and Riley Haight, like, uh, Heights would be that that sort of next guy. Murat, I think, is probably a third liner. Height, I, I think, is a unique one where he's going to have to be an offensive power play guy. He's going to have to play with other talented players to be at his best. Like Riley Heights, despite the fact that he's a pretty competitive kid and he has that chip on his shoulder that I mentioned, I don't think Riley's going to be a checker in the NHL. Uh, so he's kind of good. he's got a little bit of a boomer bust bust projection that way, where I could see him becoming that that classic high end AHL point guy who maybe takes some time to, to figure it out in the NHL. Um, but height would be after those big four height would be the next guy, guys like Hunter Hayde and Rasmus Kumpoint, like those guys are their depth pieces. Right. So um, I think that those five guys, the big four plus height would probably be uh, would probably be the guys that I, I would say you you should, you should be like for sure excited about being a part of the future. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. How's the golf game, Scott? 
the golf game is getting better. Uh, the golf game used to be like 105 to 110 on a good course. Like I was a below average golfer and I'm starting to starting to break a hundred here, which has been exciting for me. So, uh, the golf game is improving. I, I hit them straight. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm five eleven and 170 pounds. It's the, the distance. Like, uh, we're looking at 200 yards off the tee kind of thing. And the irons are, are, are 150. Like I just don't have the, uh, the power to really, to really smack it. So, uh, been working on the, on the chipping and, uh, the rest of the game is fine. So I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm starting to feel like I can actually golf well, um, which is, which is what it's all about. Even this golf scouting report sounds like a rig net report. <laughs> even, your, know, right? even your, even your, you got your uh, scouting report on your own golf game like that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we've got our last question here. Final question brought to you, as always, by our good friends at Waggle Golf. First, make sure you head over to getyourwaggleon.com, throw in promo code SP10 to take 10% off your entire or Scott, who is in your dream golf foursome? So dead or alive, celebrity, athlete, yeah, your mom, like, yeah, who are the three guys that round out your uh, foursome? Well, my grandfather, uh, my grandfather Wilf would would be one of them. Uh, he was a huge golfer, but died when I was sort of in in late elementary school, early high school. So I never actually got to play with him. Uh, but it's all all like it was his his true love. He played into like into his eighties kind of thing, into his late seventies. He was a member at, at courses and that kind of a thing. It was, it was his thing. So playing, get, getting to, to play with him, he'd probably be in that mix. And then I actually worked at the PGA tour. I worked for the Canadian side of the PGA tour, which at the time uh, was, it was called the McKenzie tour, um, which is sort of right below the web. And at the time uh, they, so we, there were some unbelievable uh, sort of golfers who came through, who I got to know, uh, sort of developed a bit of a re relationship with. So all of the top Canadian golfers, guys like uh, Corey Connors, Mackenzie Hughes, uh, they were all on the tour when I was working for the tour on the Mackenzie tour, that is. And then you had guys like Taylor Gooch and others uh, who are now sort of PGA tour players who've risen in the ranks uh, but sort of some of those Canadian guys I'd love to, some of the current Canadian guys I'd love to have around with. Certainly Mike Weir is obviously the, the Canadian legend, if you will, in the game up here. But uh, I'd love to play around with uh, with Corey and Mac Hughes and, uh, and my grandfather. That would probably be, uh, that would probably be it. Awesome. I love the family stuff too. You've got people who've mentioned some family members in there, which has been great. Um, a lot of people pick like Tiger Woods or yeah, of course. famous, famous, you know, or famous actors and stuff like that, but it's a tough one. We, we me and Scott did our own. It was really tough to tough to do. Yeah, certainly Bill Murray's. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big Bill Murray guy as well, so I'm sure he's come up in some of your answers. Mm -hmm. As Carl Spackler. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for uh, for joining us uh, off your vacation here. Um, I know everybody, the Wild fans, are excited about this last year's draft and the guys that they have coming and. Uh, in theory, some cap space after next year to to spend uh, to add around them. So, but thanks yeah. so much. We'll be, we'll catch up with you in this during the season after some major events, maybe, um, and follow up. So, thanks, Scott. Cool. Cheers, guys.